All right, so some other things you're going to need to know with core. Because everybody's got to pass core. And you got it, you can only miss seven, seven or so. You got the earth here. What's above the earth? 10 to 30 miles. What do they call that area above the earth? It's all atmosphere, but they got different parts. Like six to ground level is the troposphere, where, the, where we're breathing all our air. 10 to 30 miles is the what? Stratosphere. Okay, so you got the stratosphere, which this is where O3 is. O3, three oxygen molecules, right? You got to connect it up like that. And that is those three oxygen molecules, ozone. And what they figured out was the CFCs and the HCFCs had something in them that caused damage to these three oxygen molecules. What was it? What's the chemical that they found? And CFCs Chlorine. and HCFCs that destroyed the ozone. Chlorine. Chlorine. chlorine, yeah. And what would happen is one chlorine atom from the HCFC, the hydrochlorofluorocarbon or the chlorofluorocarbon, would get up into the atmosphere and then it would pull away one of these oxygen molecules, causing it to form chlorine monoxide. And that's what the scientists figured out was causing uh, what, how the, all the ozone was getting destroyed in the atmosphere because of the amounts of chlorine monoxide that was found in the atmosphere. They didn't find ozone, they weren't detecting chlorine, but they found that with the production rise of uh, all the refrigerants, the chlorine was also rising with the amount of chlorine monoxide that was in the stratosphere. And this thing could do it a hundred thousand times. This chlorine atom could come along and find another ozone molecule and it would have a weak bond with that oxygen molecule and break itself apart and find another one and then we have an O2 floating off somewhere and a chlorine monoxide floating off somewhere and that would continue to do it until they got through about a hundred thousand of those ozone molecules. All right, so they found a hole in the upper atmosphere which the ozone was protecting us from what? UVB radiation from the sun. So the sun now could have that UVB radiation come through the top of the stratosphere, get in contact with planet Earth, and it would cause crop loss because it would burn up the crops. It would cause eye disease because your pupils would open up and it would allow the UV rays to get inside, causing problems with your eyes. Skin cancer, all right? And then if it touched anywhere where there was water, it would kill the algae, which disrupted the whole food chain up the, up the, up the cycle there. So that was the problem with uh, the, the ozone and those HCFC refrigerants and CFC refrigerants. Now, there's a hierarchy to the system. CFCs were the worst. CFCs are chlorofluorocarbons, and that is like R11 or R12, all right? They were, they were the worst ones. Uh, there was one more that they talk about with ESCO's test, and that's R500. So these were banned Okay, in 1996, they stopped making them after 1996, January of 96. All right, and then that just left HCFCs, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, all right, which was like R22 and R123, all right, which these two refrigerants have not only chlorine, fluorine, and carbon, but they uh, have a hydrogen component, which made them less stable, less likely to reach the atmosphere. So we can continue using these until 2020, which is just only in a few years away. And then after 2020, any of these refrigerants that we use will be coming from recovered and recycled, ultimately reclaimed refrigerants, all right? Reclaimed back to uh, the same with this one. We can still use these refrigerants, but we're not getting the, any that were produced recently. All these have been reclaimed back to ARI 700 standards. So that's checking its purity back to where it's almost like it was brand new again. And ultimately that leaves us with HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons. That is the R134A and R410A. Now they're not gonna, on ESCO's test, ask any questions about 410A, all right? So you're just gonna need to know really that the 134A is the one that they're talking about that doesn't have any chlorine. Now it doesn't cause any damage to the ozone, but if it is released in the atmosphere, it does get into the atmosphere and cause global warming because it's a pollutant, it's a greenhouse gas that traps the heat 
So as the heat comes down, it's supposed to bounce off and go back into outer space. But if it hits this gas, then it doesn't bounce into outer space and it goes back and forth and then continues to go up and down and then reheating the earth every time it does go up and down. So HFCs is ultimately where they're going to. And again, chlorofluorocarbons, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, and then hydrofluorocarbons. You need to know that. You need to know the, the names of those. And what's missing from this one that these two have? Yeah. Chlorine. That's right. The chlorine's been removed. So uh, we had to, we couldn't vent these after July 1992. July of 1992, we had to start recovering all these refrigerants. And then these, after 1996, we couldn't vent these anymore. So we had to start recovering these refrigerants. Even though they didn't cause any ozone depletion, they still figured out that it was global warming. And ultimately, they're going to go to another refrigerant. Uh, it's not going to be these. These are just also going to be interim refrigerants. So, Other things you're going to need to know about the test. This chlorine that they're talking about is not the same chlorine that we put in our pools. The chlorine that we put in our pools and in our water for drinking at the treatment plants is chlorine that dissolves in water and breaks down. That's naturally occurring chlorine. The chlorine that we're using for our refrigerants is man-made chlorine. It's not the same chlorine. So which one has the worst ozone depletion CFC. potential? CFC. CFC, that's right. CFC has the worst. And give me some examples of CFC. R11. R11. R12, R500. All right, what's the next one that's not as bad, but still has some damage to the ozone? HCFCs. HCFCs. And give me an example of two HCFCs. R120. R123 and? Wait, no. No? R22. Yep. And then ultimately, the ones that we're using, HFCs, and what's one of those? R34. R34A. Now, let me ask you this. Is there a drop-in replacement for these? Can I just take out the R12 and put in R134A? Yeah. They've got about the same pressures and temperatures, but can I just swap them out refrigerant for refrigerant? What refrigerant oil does this type of refrigerant use? CFCs. Anybody know? Mineral. Mineral oil. These use man, not man-made, but natural oil. Mineral oil. All right, so that used a mineral oil base. R22 also could use mineral oil, or it could use, HCFCs really use alkabenzene. So alkabenzene oil was really for HCFCs, and then polyester oil is for the new refrigerants, the HFCs. Now you can't take R12 and replace it with 134A because you also need to change the oil. If you left that mineral oil in with 134A, something actually breaks down with the oil and it forms a wax. All right, so you can't leave that oil in. Uh, the polyester oil is what's used for R134A refrigerants. So there is no drop in. You can't just take one out and put one in according to the test. Some violations of the Clean Air Act. All right, so if you don't keep records of how much refrigerant you're taking out, then you can be, you can, so you can be written up for violating the Clean Air Act. Any system I go to that you've got to take refrigerant out, you've got to know how much you're taking out and how much you're putting back in, and it's got to be logged. Uh, if you don't get to the vacu vacuum rates, that 0, 10, 10, 0, 4, 4, 4, 0, 10, 10, 15, yeah, if you're not getting down to those before you open the appliance, then you also could be fine for that. Uh, if they catch you venting any of these refrigerants, any of them, if you got caught just cutting the line and letting the refrigerant blow in the atmosphere or opening up the gauges and just letting the hose blow the refrigerant out, uh, then that's also a violation of the Clean Air Act, and you can also be fined for that as well. What is the fine, by the way? You remember? Now the real fine is thirty-seven thousand five hundred, but the test the test is a little outdated. So the the fine, all right, the fine for violating any of these, doing any of those things is for the test twenty-seven thousand five hundred. But really, it's thirty-seven now. And out of that, what's the reward that a technician would get or somebody would get? Yeah, ten thousand dollars. Okay, so you get ten thousand dollars for turning somebody in. Other thing, if you uh, uh, don't uh, recover all the refrigerant out of a disposable cylinder and render it useless, that also could be a violation of it. Uh, or if you add nitrogen to a fully charged system, like you just go up to a system and it's got a full amount of charge in it, you put nitrogen on top of that, you can't recover nitrogen. So that's also 
a violation. You're going to need to know the three R's. Recover. Recover means you're going to take it out and put it in a tank. All right? And then recycle means before you put it back in the system, you're going to run it through a filter dryer. Now, the filter dryer could even be connected to the recovery machine, or it could just be in line in a hose. doesn't matter. As long as it goes through one filter dryer, that is recycling, and reclaiming is done back at the factory. So that's going to be Dow, DuPont, it's one of the chemical uh, air gas, somebody like that that's going to reclaim it back to ARI 700 specifications. Two types of recoveries. Equipment, you got system dependent, all right, and that's uh, one way of doing it where you're just relying on the system's pressure or the compressor of the unit if it's running, and then uh, 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 self-contained. Self-contained is we got our own recovery machine um, that's uh, going to do, do it for us. It's going to have its own compressor to suck the refrigerant out. A uh, couple things. If you got a three-part blend, let's say we mixed R11, R12, and R500 together, all right, we're going to make that up. It's going to be like R499. R499, that three-part blend, is called a tenary blend. Tenary blend, three-part, tenary. You just need to know the definition. Now, when blended refrigerants are mixed together, they usually have different boiling and condensing points. All right, so it might wear a single component refrigerant or azeotrope refrigerant is going to have one boiling, one condensing point, like water. What's the boiling point of water? 212 degrees Fahrenheit, yeah, and that condenses and boils at 212. So if I had a bag of steam, of 214 degrees steam, I cool it down to 212, the steam's going to start changing to a water. If I had a pot of water that was 210 degrees and I heat it up to 212, that means I'm going to start to see one more, one little bubble, one bubble start to form in that pot of water. It's going to start to change state. So this is at saturation temperature. So single components have one boiling and condensing point. But these other refrigerants, these blended refrigerants, right, they have maybe a dew point, all right, and the dew point might be at like 210 degrees Fahrenheit, and then the condensing point might be at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, when they have a range of dew and condensing points, that means that it has a two degree temperature glide. Temperature glide means it has a range of condensing and boiling points. That's all you need to know about it. Temperature glide means it doesn't have one number where it boils and condenses. It has two numbers. And uh, zeotropic refrigerants, they have two things that happen to them. They have a really big temperature glide. In other words, it's going to be like 210 where it dews and 242 where it condenses. So that would be like a 42 degree temperature glide. It's going to have a real big spread there on that. And it does a thing called fractionation. Fractionation is sort of when, let's say if I had a, a tank of refrigerant, we just made one up, R499A, all right? So I take a tank and I mix refrigerant, almost like mixing oil and water. In liquid form, the refrigerant mixes really good together. So let's say I've got some R12 and R22. And the R22, I'm gonna color in green. And in liquid form, they mix really well together. That's if I had 50-50, I got 50% of the R12 and 50% of the R22. But in vapor form, because they have different vapor pressures and weights, right, the lighter of the two will go to the top and the heavier of the two will stay at the bottom. So this is why they need to be charged as a liquid, because if I open the valve here, what's going to come out? R22. The R22, yeah, the green one, the lighter of the two. And then once I let some of that R22 out, well, now I don't have 50-50 anymore like I did with the liquid. I've got like 25% R22 and 75% of the other refrigerant, which is R12. So now we've got a different, same mixture, right, but different proportions. Well, now I have not R499, but R499A. That's what the A means. When you see an A on the side, that's where they've taken the same mixtures and changed the percentages around a little bit. And that's where they get the A or the B or the C, where they're using the same refrigerants to combine a couple together, but they've changed up the proportions a little bit. So that's why these, they'll tell you this end up for liquid, because some have a dip tube that run down the bottom, and the dip tube allows the pressure of the refrigerant to push the liquid up the tube, and then the liquid comes out. What's another way I could get the liquid out if it didn't have a dip tube? <clears throat> Yeah, turn the tank upside down, turn the tank upside down, okay? So those are the things you're going to need to know with these refrigerants. One, temperature glide, all right, the zeotrope refrigerants, they're the ones that have a, a blended refrigerant. 
uh, and that they, they have a lot of temperature glide, and they also fractionate, which means when, when they are in vapor form, they separate. So they're very difficult to charge if you had to charge it in vapor form. You really can't. You've got to charge it in liquid. And the way you charge it as a liquid is you just hook the hose up to the liquid, and you still charge through the suction side, but you throttle it. You let a little bit of liquid in at a time, and then as it comes in, it sucks up into the system and boils off before it gets to the, gets to the uh, inside the cylinder and the piston to the compressor. So, uh, leak detection, always want to use electronic leak detector or ultrasonic leak detector to find the general area of the leak. Once you know the general area, you can pinpoint it using the soap bubbles. All right, and then you want to make sure that you vacuum always down to 500 microns with a micron gauge. Uh, the bigger the vacuum pump, the faster it'll take, but you can cause the moisture in the system to freeze if it's uh, too big of a vacuum pump on a small system. So they tell you to use uh, hoses that are short in length and large in diameter as possible. The bigger the diameter, the faster the vacuum will flow because it can allow for more flow. Uh, and then the shorter the hose, again, you don't have as much a restriction. You want the vacuum gauge as far away from the vacuum pump as possible. Okay, you don't want the vacuum pump close to, or the vacuum gauge close to the vacuum pump because it'll give it some uh, different readings. Uh, and then the recovery cylinders, do not use a disposable cylinder as a recovery cylinder. They're only for virgin refrigerant and you never heat it with a torch. So you can heat it with a hot water bath uh, or something else, but you cannot use a torch to heat it up. 80% uh, on the recovery cylinders, so the cylinders that are yellow and gray, you never want to fill them more than 80% of their capacity. And most of them are either 25 or 30 pound tanks or 50 pound tanks. Those are the two most common types. They're regulated by the DOT and uh, should be inspected for rust or breakage or bends or anything like that. Uh, and if you got any uh, rust or if it's damaged, dented, or scratched, you've uh, deep gouged, scratched, then you should probably take it out of commission. And then they should be tested every, hydrostatically tested every five years. Uh, a couple things, charging a system with nitrogen should have a regulator. Uh, the regulator should have a pressure relief device. If the pressure relief device looks like it's corroded, it needs to be replaced. Uh, the pressure relief device is uh, never installed in series. If you're looking for how much pressure to put in the system, you got to look at the data plate and go with the low side test pressure. And then anytime you got Schrader valves, pull them out. Schrader valves, pull them out, it blocks the flow and it'll take a longer recovery. Uh, and then if you notice any bends or breakage or damage to the Schrader valve, replace it and then cap it when it's not in use. Uh, anytime you got a large release of refrigerant, vacate and ventilate. And then when R11, any of these refrigerants really, when they come in contact with heat, high temperature flame, they can form hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, and phosgene gas. That's mustard gas. All right, hydrochloric and hydrofluoric acid not only form with heat, uh, high temperature flame, but also with moisture in the system. So if you don't vacuum and dehydrate the system out all the way, uh, the moisture can get into the uh, refrigerant and cause hydrochloric and hydrofluoric acid. Always check the MSDS sheets when working with any chemicals. And then anytime you're shipping any of these recovery cylinders, they got to have a 2.2 non-flammable gas tag on it. Uh, and that's pretty much all they need, although it should have the type and the amount of the refrigerant that's in there on the tank somewhere as well, but that's not required. Any questions about core?